Review. Obviously, I should start my video. Are you doing yeah, it? Or if you want to start the video, then you'll have to turn off the. Um, 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 hi, welcome. Hello. Let you go, guys. I'll just let you guys get set up. So I want. Yeah. Okay. Should I stop? I shouldn't have audio on mine, right? Yeah, disconnect audio. No, no, no. There will be things. Um, yeah, in this frame. Like this, and then this one is on. Yeah, because that's why it's not viewing the other the one. The camera is just. Yeah, there. One question. Come on, guys. Let's go back. Marcel, are you present?
Alexander and I exited to rename our. Hello? Oh, you exited. Oh, okay. So let me. Yeah, if you'd re let Alexander and I in. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Oh, it didn't do it. You're trying to rename? Yeah, it, it was on the phones. It just didn't want to do it. So if you click on more. You have to disconnect audio first. <laughs> so if you click on more, it's not doing it. Hang on one second. We're trying to. Do you want me to rename you? What do you want me to rename you? I think I can do it. Okay, the um, the second Bill Cazzini <laughs> that's with the little cat icons. Okay. That one yes. should be a prep board. Prep Just so board. people know. Yeah. Okay, is that good? That's it, perfect. And then the other one is fine? And then the one that's Alexander, that'll be a stove view. Okay. And then, are you good with the last one, Aziz? You'll be able to look at the laptop and see, by the way. Okay. Okay. And the other one is fine, Bill, the last one. Oh, the stove view, that's interesting. It looks like it's um on the side, right? Yeah, it's in um pull it out and reshift it because it's it's in a portrait portrait instead of a landscape. Okay, Alicia, I'll log into your phone and uh there you right go. There. Well, let me see. I'll go check. The content is still doing the same. I mean, it's it's upright and everything, but it's it's a skinnier camera. You know what I mean? Well, I have the camera. Flipped. I mean, what I was thinking was, you would have it like this. So it looks like that. So let me see how this comes up. No, it's only with the end. I mean, the front exactly camera. It is. Does it better now? Um. Mine's still really skinny for some reason. There you go, it's fixed. It's perfect, yeah. You just have to um, flip the camera. Is that right? Well, on the screen, it's facing you. So oh, it is okay. okay. So okay. you just have to, or you can do it the other way. Sure, but we'll get to look from the laptop, but the one that looks right, that's the 
more than weighted. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah? Uh, just a moment. Oh, yeah, I would actually, um, I would actually put it on the outer face of your hand and it would work. Okay, Marcel, um, if you could just um, uh, allow Alicia to come into the room, then we'll post her phone up. It... Yeah, just leave it unlocked now. You want me to rename her phone anything or no? I think if she's it's Alicia. Alicia. She's Alicia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I hear us. I hear. You hear? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, so let me see now. What happened?
You can hear me, Alicia? Mm -hmm. Through the headphones, good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. I have to go grab something a minute. I'll be right back. Alexander, can you grab me an orange off that tree? That's okay, it doesn't really matter. If you could rinse it off. Yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. On this, on that platter over there.
Move your head side to side, honey. Okay. It picks up the moving of the paper very well. Oh, really? Okay, are you guys ready? One person is waiting. So yeah, I'll we're ready. I think ready? so. Okay. Joe's ready. All right. I have a cutting board for this. Huh? <laughs> Hi, Christina. We're just Hello. getting ready. You have cute something on your head. Yes. Oh, it's oh, it's sparkly antlers. Yes. How cute yes. is that? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Give it a few more minutes. Yes. This is a really fun idea, Marcel. Yeah, thank you. It remains to be seen how uh, how it will go, but we're open, right, Alicia? Yeah, I, we I think are it, open. This is <laughs> very, this is unique and fun. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Good, good idea. Kate said she was coming. Yes, yes, I sent her, she registered, so I'm sure. She'll be here soon. I'm going to try and sign in for my iPad as well. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> all right, I'll put them back I in. Just, it, every sound picks up with those very well. So that's okay. Well, if they make noise, let me know. <laughs> Hi, Kate. We're just getting started, just getting situated. Yeah. 
do this oh, to you okay. here is. Oh, cool. Okay. Just the shrunk. She's doing her little welcome right now. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Marcel Dugan, the Director of Visitation here at Los Gatos United Methodist Church. And I am pleased to welcome Alicia Galou, who is going to be taking through um, a delightful a gastronomical delight this afternoon. Um, if, you were, if you were here a couple of years ago, you will remember Alicia. She's no stranger to our church. You will remember her from um, the health fair that we had a couple of years ago when she did a nice kitchen kitchen demonstration. She made salmon with a mango salsa, really delicious. And, you know, I got letters, Alicia, from people saying how much they enjoyed that. So, Oh, that's so sweet, Marcel. And I'm so happy to be back. Yes, we're very happy to have you back. So um, I'll <laughs> be quiet now and let you do your thing. Welcome, Alicia. Okay. Hi, how, I, how is everybody? This is kind of a new concept for me, uh, talking into a camera, but I will do my best to imagine I see you because I don't. Um, so if you want to ask me any questions, just you know, yell my name during this whole thing. It's kind of an interactive process. Um, so Marcel and I talked about what we wanted to do and what we wanted to do was a festive kind of holiday feeling meal uh, during this time, however, with the state of the world and the circumstances of COVID, et cetera, we're kind of forced to have smaller group gatherings. And therefore we thought about it and we thought rather than doing a turkey, let's do a chicken. Um, and so I've decided to kind of introduce you to a technique or two of how to do a roast chicken the way I like to do it. Um, and I'm gonna show you two techniques on one chicken. So I'll explain that to you as we go. Um, along with the chicken that we're gonna be having, we're going to have a side dish of roasted Brussels sprouts with butternut squash and cranberry. And that is a very healthy kind of colorful 
festive dish that's also you know healthy and easy. That's one thing that's very important to remember because we don't want to have to work too hard um, when we're doing multiple dishes. Uh, on top of that, we're going to do stuffing. Now the stuffing initially I was going to you know put inside a turkey and I decided to rather than do that, just do a classic stuffing and then discuss different types of stuffings that you can make with that basic stuffing. And we're gonna do it in a little bit of a different way. So we'll, I'll talk to you about that, but we are not gonna stuff the chicken because I wanna show you just how to do a, cl a classic roast chicken without stuffing. Of course, you could always stuff the chicken. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. And then the last dish that we're gonna have is a winter salad. And the winter salad has Belgian endive, red and white. If you don't have Belgian endive, which are difficult to find, uh, it doesn't matter. You can use any kind of lettuce, um, preferably um, a green leaf lettuce or a, a romaine or something like that, that has a, a little bit of uh, texture to it. We don't want something like a wilty kind of a uh, spinachy thing going on there because it needs to hold on to some uh, blue cheese and toasted walnuts. And we're gonna also have some apple in there, colorful apple. Um, and that dish will be plated up and refrigerated ahead of time. And speaking of that, um, we're gonna have a quick talk about what I call and what everybody in culinary world calls um, mise en place. Mise en place is in French literally, uh, it means put in place. And it basically was created by a chef named Auguste Escoffier during the early 1900s because he put together a system like a brigade system, which was a system of hierarchy in kitchens. And uh, as part of that, the, the idea is to get all of the ingredients for the dishes that you're making. First step is to gather all of those ingredients in a place. And the second step is to get those ingredients chopped up and measured out and ready to go. Um, so I want to tell you, and I don't know if I can show you this, but I have set up the way I learned how to do this is in culinary school and working in a professional kitchen. So to do mise en place in my brain, because my brain gets easily confused, I like to do it on sheet pans. So I will, first thing will, will happen is you'll come in and you'll say, okay, we've got our roast chicken sheet pan. If you don't have a sheet pan for all of these things, which I'm sure you don't, I don't even want you to worry about that. If you can find a space in your kitchen where you can kind of just put the raw ingredients for each dish aside, uh, we can then move on from there. So for the roast chicken, I have right here, my tray. I even wrote roast chicken on a piece of paper. Um, on this tray I have, and you guys, if you can do this and you have the ability to do it and you've gotten the things, I hope I gave you a, a good enough list. I'm not sure I did, but we need a box of chicken broth with some kind of receptacle. This is a, a measuring cup, some kitchen twine, some olive oil and a, a brush for the chicken. Uh, this is just a dull knife, some kind of a dull butter knife, and a, a lemon, some garlic, a big head of garlic. And if you can have one of these things, this is a, a great little tool to have for basting, a baster. I also have an onion here that's cut up. Um, don't worry about that, but if you have an onion, just grab an onion. So let's go over it one more time. Broth, kitchen twine, don't worry if you don't have it olive oil, baster, lemon, garlic, and an onion. Also just a kitchen knife will be great and a brush. Um, oh yeah, I just had some warming butter on the stove, which I'll turn down now. Um, thank you. So that's my first tray. And if you have your tray set up, do you guys all have these ingredients in your around you? Yes, okay. Um, 
All right, so let's begin by, we're gonna look at our chicken. This is our chicken. Now this is a pasture raised chicken. And I want you to always choose a pasture raised chicken if you can. Um, there are free range chickens. There are pa pasture raised chickens. There are cage free chickens and organic chickens and they all have a different uh, designation and what they are. The one that gets to really roam out in the nature and be a real chicken is a pasture raised chicken. Um, and for many reasons, that's the one that you should choose. Whole Foods has the whole chicken in uh, pasture raised, but I recommend a place called Good Eggs if you want to or order any pasture raised poultry. Um, it really does make a difference. It's also air chilled and air chilled is really important. It's the way that after the, the chicken is slaughtered within a couple of hours, they have to bring the chicken down to 40 degrees Celsius and they need to, uh, they, have, they do that by chilling it over about three hours with cold air. And that's better than what they often do, which is submerging it in water. Submerging the chicken in water actually makes it absorb water and it's harder to cook and doesn't get crispy. So we're gonna take, we're gonna start with our chicken. Um, can everybody, I can't hear anyone. Can anybody hear me? Okay, that's fine. I just wanna make sure that if anybody has a question, I won't know, but that's okay. Somebody will tell me. <laughs> okay, Marcel. <laughs> okay, so this is my chicken. I will call her Chicky. Um, and we're gonna, this is a, a lovely chicken. Um, what we're gonna do with it first is we're going to just make sure that it's washed, rinsed, and looked over for pin feathers, anything like that, and dried with a paper towel. Uh, because we want our, our spices to stick to it, okay? I am melting a little bit of butter on the stove. And I also have preheated my oven to 425 degrees. And I want you to do the same. Okay. So by the time our chicken is ready, uh, and you guys can tell me to slow down too, but by the time our chicken is ready, I mean, our oven is heated, we'll be ready to put her in there. Um, while you guys are getting organized, I'll. I'll tell you that this is my trash bowl. I always like to have a trash bowl. And the reason for that also is because what I do is I put the remainder of onion skins and garlic skins and things like that in my trash bowl, only not the paper things. And then I can make a, a vegetable broth with it later. So I, when I was cooking and teaching culinary school, we, we would collect this stuff and then we would keep it in a, a a plastic bag in the freezer. And once we got enough of that, we would make a nice veggie broth with it. So it's a good way of saving your scraps. Um, and it's also more convenient to have there. So we're gonna start with our chicken. Um, we're gonna take her and put her up this way. And we're going to salt the inside of her liberally and pepper the inside of her as well, okay? Once you've done that, I'm gonna to try to describe these two different methods. The first method I'm gonna do is just your classic, no herb, less fattening version of the chicken, okay? Because we were talking about doing that. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're going to take a lemon right here. Do you all have a lemon? I hope you do. Um, and I can slow down, Marcel, tell me if you need me to slow down at all. Can you hear me, Marcel? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'm going to cut this lemon into quarters. And actually eighths, because I think this might be a little bit too much. I think half of a, a lemon is enough. And I'm going to just throw those inside my chicken. Okay. Stick them in there. The next thing I'm going to do is I am going to stick a branch of thyme inside her like that. Um, and once I've got those things in there, I'm gonna take my garlic and I'm gonna cut it in half, not up and down, but sideways. So I hope you can see like this, okay? Carefully, because it can slip. Kind of fell apart, but that's okay. We're gonna stick this 
inside the chicken. Once that stuff goes in there, it's just going to meld with the juices of the chicken as it cooks and it's gonna make a lovely sauce around it. We're gonna take a little bit of butter that we've melted on the stove. And I don't know if you have done that, but if you have not, I'm sorry, I mentioned it, but I didn't tell you to do that. You can always stick uh, a little butter in the microwave and just melt it and take your time and just brush her liberally with the butter. The butter is a better choice than olive oil for poultry. And I know that we're trying to be low cal. I would say this is probably the most low cal way we can do a chicken um, or lightest way. Uh, I'm gonna mess that up in a minute kind of, but maybe not, I don't know. Yes, I am, yes, I am. Okay, so this is how we go. A lot of butter. Um, the butter has milk solids in it that will burn a little bit and that's what gives us that golden skin. That's why it's better than olive oil. Um, I don't like to use anything but salt and pepper. So, and we are going to really liberally go at it with the, uh, uh, with the salt because that's what gives it a lot of flavor. Don't be afraid. And the pepper. It's always nice to have your salt and pepper in containers where you can use your fingers to pinch and rather than having to, you know, shake and things like that, you get much more um, control that way. So now that she has got the thyme, the garlic and the lemon in there, the butter, and then she's got herself all spiced out. Um, this is where we would stop if we were going to not take it to the next level. But it's me and I like to take things to the next level. So I'm taking it to the next level. Um, what I like to do is take some herbs. I have a mixture of parsley, sage, a little bit of basil. Um, you may not have parsley because I didn't mention parsley and you don't have to do any of this. As a matter of fact, you probably shouldn't just because I didn't tell you to get all of these things, but I wanted to demonstrate this anyway. Um, so you're gonna do a nice light chop, loose, or, you know, fine if you can get to fine. Generally with herbs, you're gonna to have to do them and separate them out a little bit. So you, you take them, do a big chop like this, like a bigger chop, and then you're gonna kind of, and I'll demonstrate these knife skills a little better later. I kind of find it's easier if I separate the herbs into two groups or three. This knife my daughter gave me from France and I love it so much. And it's just a little eight inch knife. Um, I used to use this long, big knife and many like them, but I now I like this little knife and it's actually great, but it's also not, I don't get things done as fast because it's so short. Okay, so I did that. What I'm gonna do now is add a nice dollop of olive oil to that, okay? And some salt going to make kind of like a little paste with it. I'm going to do a little more chopping here. I feel like it won't work as well if I don't. Um, you guys don't have to do this, but I do recommend doing this on a Sunday for dinner sometime. Um, and you don't have to do all of this other stuff if you do what I'm doing. Okay. The next step is, and this is very gingerly done and sometimes not easy. It's like surgery. Uh, I have to put my glasses on for this. Okay. Uh, you want to take the skin ever so gently because it will rip. You see how it's at the end here? And you're going to just make, you're going to get underneath the skin. You see how I got under the skin there with that knife? Okay. And kind of give it a little, I don't know if you can see this or not, but yeah. Um, and I'm going to do it again on this side, but I just use my fingers to break through the skin, as you see, I'm underneath there, getting under there, making a little pocket. Okay, so I have two pockets here. And I'm now gonna stick my herbs inside the pocket. It can be messy, it's okay. Don't be worried. Okay, that's one. 
And then we're to the other side. I hope I'm not going too fast, but I do have a million things to do. No, it's good. Thank you, Kate. Awesome. I feel so much better. Okay. Um, excuse my dark dogs barking. They will be a problem. Okay, I'm gonna wash my hands. Of course, we have to do that. And by the way, I did want to mention that you should always have your hands washed and washing them throughout the time that you're cooking. Very important. Okay, so now that I've got my herbs in there, I have another little trick of the trade. Before I did any of this, and this is just, a, I decided to do this at the last minute, so bear with me. Um, I took two slices of butter. I know, Marcel, this is supposed to be low calorie. <laughs> um, but I'm going to stick those That's up okay. there. <laughs> okay, just, yeah. you know me, I can't help it. So you see how I stuck that, that in there? Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's just gonna make this unbelievable broth with the garlic and the lemon on the inside, which you don't have to do if you're doing all this, but why not, right? And all the remainder of the herby stuff, you just kind of rub on the chicken, right back. I'm gonna stick some rosemary in there just for the hell of it, okay. All right, so there she is. She's ready to go. I'm gonna put her on top of, just take an onion, cut it in half if you want. If you have a big one, cut it into quarters. Just throw it in there like so. And I know that I was supposed to have my garlic together. Remember when I cut it in half? I wanted it to be together because it was gonna kind of hold her up. But I'm gonna just stick those in the middle like that. Okay. And now I'm going to kind of clean up. Alexander, can you come take this away and wash my knife for me? Okay, watch out. I'm going to wash my hands. Okay. Um, now we're, we all, the last thing we need to do really quickly is just tie her up or truss the chicken uh, so that the little legs that are flying around. Um, isn't great because uh, the chicken will dry out and the ends of the the legs will burn, the wings will burn, etc. So I want you to take your chicken and face her away from you with her legs facing away from you and her arms about to hug you like this. And you're going to take some of your chicken twine. And by the way, this thing, this kind of thing also works for the using the, um, this little spatula, they're handy also for kind of getting under the skin. But I find like a, a, just a regular butter knife works great too. You wanna take some kitchen twine and cut it to about, I would say like almost three lengths of your chicken so that you have enough to work with. You're just gonna take the chicken legs. You're gonna put the string underneath her feet and I'm gonna do this, if you want, I can do it twice. I'm um, gonna cross, pull her legs together, put the string between her legs and the side of her body, okay? Around her little arms, tighten it with your thumbs and gently flip her over. Now, make sure you have her arms underneath the string. And you're gonna tie it nice and tight like that. Do you guys want me to do it again or are you okay with just one time? Do you have an answer there? Well, everyone's muted and waiting to see if someone has a comment. Could you do it again? Yes, I can do it again. I, I, I know that feeling. Okay, so she feels so beat up. Look at her. <laughs> <laughs> so you have the chicken with the legs facing away from you, okay? I want you to take your twine, and now it's kind of greasy, so I hope I get a grip on it. Um, you're gonna take the twine, it's about three lengths of your chicken, go underneath the legs of the chicken, the feet, kind of, cross, you see how I cross, I can pull her feet together now. 
Then I'm gonna go between her legs and the side of her body, around her arms to the best of my ability now that she's greasy, I'm greasy. And I'm gonna flip her over. And you'll see now I have her arms, you have to kind of readjust sometimes, under the, the string, tight like that, you see? So now she won't flap around in there. And if you have like Alexandra to come, except she didn't wash her hands, so it's okay. Oh, Alexandra washed her hands. So if you have a partner in crime, Alexandra, come put your finger here on that, okay? And then you're just gonna tie a knot. Done, okay? Now she's lovely. You're gonna trim off the excess. String, because nobody wants to eat string. We're gonna pop her on top of the onions. Now I did a little something else. I didn't have you guys do it, but I, I just had extra carrots and stuff. So I'm just gonna throw that around the bottom. If you guys wanna cut up some carrots or anything else, onions, go ahead and do that. Okay. And you don't need a big roasting pan for a chicken. I kind of like, if you have a roasting pan that's too big, um, your vegetables will get burnt and dried out easily. So I kind of like to use a smaller one um, like this. Um, some chefs like to do this and I'm gonna do it. Um, I should have done it earlier, but uh, take a very decisive cut into each leg just one on each side. Could you Sometimes, turn it around and show? Yeah. So I could have done this earlier and I almost didn't do it. Um, Cause I'm not always sure it's the best thing to do but I'm, I think I'm gonna do it on this chicken cause it's a little bigger. So if you do two like decisive cuts into the leg like that, you'll ensure that the flavors get in and you'll also ensure that the leg cooks as quickly as the rest of the chicken. So now I'm gonna put her in the 425 degrees for an hour and a half. Okay, I need Alexandra help. Okay, next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna take you through, yeah, you can do that. Um, I'm gonna take you through the mise en place of the other, other dishes that we have on the docket, okay? Um, we have to put together our ingredients for our Brussels sprouts and uh, butternut squash dish. We need to put together our ingredients mm. for our stuffing because the stuffing requires a little bit of work. Let's get that started first. I also wanted to show you that, I don't know if you noticed that I had this uh, towel underneath my cutting board. Um, the towel is a really important thing to have. I wanna show you this really quickly. Um, I use a big towel, but what works just as well, surprisingly, is a paper towel. So, you know, like if you go skiing or something and you're in a cottage somewhere and you, you have like a really bad cutting board and it's wobbling all over the place, you just wet a paper towel like that, shake it out. And I probably should have more than this, but if you do that, it's not gonna move. Okay, so this is my mise for, and they call that the mise in French, the mise en place for my stuffing. And this the way that we're gonna do the stuffing today is uh, we are not going 
to stuff it in the bird, as I mentioned to you. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about stuffing. This is, I'm sure you all know how to make stuffing. You've made lots of different stuffings and that kind of thing. So this probably won't be a big shock to you, but I wanted to go through it anyway, because I wanted to demonstrate some nice knife skills to you. Uh, it's very important uh, when you're using a knife to make sure that your knife is sharp. It's also important to have the right tools. So now you see my cutting board isn't moving. That's really important. A knife needs to be sharp. This is a really good little knife sharpener. Uh, Lisa, can you yes. let us know some good brands for knives and then a sharpener uh, as well? Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. My and how favorite much brand. Would you spend for a good knife. Yeah. Yeah. For a good knife, you're going to end up spending at least a hundred dollars. Probably a little bit more. It's probably the most important thing you'll ever have in your kitchen. I can tell you the few, the only things you really need to have in a kitchen. That's one of them. Um, I recommend the brand Wustoff, which is W-U-S-T-O-F. It's a German knife. Um, also, there's a Japanese brand of knife that, um, what is it called? It's escaping me, but I'll tell you at the end. Marcel, can you remind me at the end? And I'll tell you because it's just for some reason going out of my head. Um, but sure, they're I really just okay. those two um, are my two favorite. There are lots of really good brands, but if you really just want to be on the safe side, I would get Rustaf. They're available everywhere. You can get them at Sur La Table. If I don't even know if Sur La Table is open anymore, but um, it's you know it's it's really a, a great knife. Now Alexandra gave me this knife, <laughs> um, my daughter, and she, it's from France, and I don't even know where it's from, but I'll talk to you about the knife a little bit. So a knife has, a, a, the anatomy of the knife is, this is called the bolster. You see the bolster? It's like at the base of the knife. These are called rivets. And this is of course is the tip, this is the spine, this is the blade. Um, when you hold a knife, the first thing you wanna do is you're gonna take the knife with your, finger and thumb, forefinger and thumb, and grip the knife at the top of the bolster and the base of the knife. You see where I have it? And then you're gonna wrap your three remaining fingers around, around the handle and adjust it. You know, So this is how you're holding it. It's almost like you're choking the knife a little bit. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but it's, it's the way that you'll have a lot more control. And it takes time and practice to get used to holding a knife that way. Um, a lot of people wanna hold the knife like this or like this, and this is the way. Now, when you're chopping like I did with those herbs, you're gonna hold it like this. Okay, but that's the only time. Sometimes I hope, because I have really bad arthritis, I'll hold my knife like this to chop, but, um, you get the idea with the knife? Okay. Um, this is a sharpener. This is a Vustoff sharpener. It's not expensive, but I would recommend taking your knives once or twice a year to sharpen while you shop, <laughs> where my boyfriend Bill and I go a couple times a year. Uh, there's a guy who hangs out at Lenardi's um, and he has a sharpening business. And so you can just drop your knives off with him I think you pay, you know, ten dollars a knife, and he will really sharpen them with a stone and that kind of thing. This works, you know, well. But you, every year, at least once a year, if you're really serious about cooking and you cook a lot, you want to probably get them professionally uh, sharpened that way. And you can find him, and if you go to Lenardi's and ask. Uh, they'll tell you when he will come around. I know COVID has changed things a lot, but this this thing is pretty simple. You just kind of want to sharpen it. I, mine is fairly sharp, but I'm just demonstrating how you Alicia, do that. Alicia, is it any Lunardi's or is it a particular one? Any Lunardi's, I think. But the one okay. that we've gone to the most is the one over on uh, over on like Campbell area. 
Okay. Yes. It's it's near the International Food Bazaar. Yes. And okay. it's on Bascom, I think. And Bascom, Cutner, right? And Kurtner. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Um, and also this honer, people think this is a knife sharpener, but it's not. What it really does is if you think about a knife, if you take a knife and you look at it with a microscope, you'll see that um, that what's at the end of your blade is actually microscopic little wire hairs if you will. And this just combs them into the right direction. So you want to, this is how you'll do it. You don't have to be flinging things around in the air. You know, um, you're just going to hold it like this every time you sharpen it. And every once in a while, like if you're, you, you want to kind of just get it a little bit sharper. You just kind of pass it up and down, going top to bottom and towards you, top to bottom and towards you like this to get your little wires straight, if you know what I mean. That way it'll go through a tomato much more easily. I'm gonna cry and get, not keep you here forever. Um, so for the stuffing, what you need on your tray is a little bit of celery, um, some herbs. I know you have some herbs, whatever you have would be great. Uh, a bag of stuffing. We can also make our own cubes yeah. of stuffing, but I, for the sake of time, I just bought this. Um, and an onion. And you know, I don't even have garlic really for this. So what I wanna do right now is just show you how to cut an onion. I don't know if you know how to cut an onion or not, um, but let's do that. This is, I'm gonna use my trash bowl now, so excited. So I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna, you see the onion has a root end and it has like a flower end, if you will. The root, root end is the hairy part. You wanna take your knife gently and carefully, make sure that you take all the dead skin off that you can, because that can be a bit of a hazard um, if it's flailing around. And you're just gonna cut right through the, you're gonna cut right through the onion and then you're going to cut you see at the end right where that I call it the flowery end just cut the edges off of that put it in your little broth bowl and also I just want to make sure to, if you need me to go over what's on my tray I will go over that but it's onion herbs celery and I have gluten-free bread because I know that you guys might want to do an, a gluten-free version um, and that would just require you to cut the bread up into cubes is all. And uh, I know Marcel's family is gluten-free. A lot of people are these days. Okay, so as you see, I peeled, I peeled my half of my onion and I left a tail on it like that. And I can leave that tail on if I want to, it makes it easier to hold on to. And you're gonna take your cutting board close to you like this, as close to you as possible and you're going to put the palm of the heel of your hand on the top of your onion. You're gonna take your knife and tilt it down ever so slightly, just ever so slightly, so that it doesn't flip up and cut you. And you're gonna start from the top and you're gonna cut, think of it as like an apartment building. You're making the first floor, okay? So I just cut, as you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I made the first floor. Yes, you can. Now I'm gonna, and I'm, as you see, I'm, I'm close to the edge here. I made the first floor, now I'm gonna make the second floor. But another thing that I learned in culinary school that I had a really hard time with this for a long time, I would push really hard on my onion and I'd be like, why is it so much easier for everybody else? <laughs> and then I realized that I was pushing too hard. So now I, I realized that, you know, I just gently push, you know, just enough. So I did my third floor, my fourth floor. Let's see, we'll do five floors, okay? Now you don't go all the way through the root, okay? You wanna, the root's gonna hold the onion together. Now we're gonna make the apartments. So same thing, you're not gonna go through the root. You're just going to cut, now you're cutting vertically down. Okay, so now I've got a whole sequence of little cuts in this. And I'm gonna use my hand like a claw now. 
And that's because I don't want to cut my finger off. <laughs> it's a good reason. Um, <laughs> um, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But so now I'm just cutting and dicing. It's a lot easier this way, right? And if you have this left over, I, I either go, you know, like this and I get the rest of it and then chop it a little bit, you know, kind of thing. But you've got your onion, okay? So got my onion and now I'm gonna do the celery. I hope I'm not taking too much time. Everything should be washed and dried. The celery and the uh, leaves can be used. Um, that's not to go to waste. Now with celery and with anything that you're cutting that's really long, this isn't that long, but imagine that we're like this long, it would be really hard to work with. So cut it in half, okay? And then I'm gonna take it, hold it by the corner of its rib, and I'm just gonna slice it into pieces. Move it aside. I'm going to do the same. Do the same with this one. It takes a little skill, but and I'm going to do the same. I think I'll cut this part off for now, just because. And I did that. Okay. I, I hope you guys are following this. But in any case, I want to make my onion and my celery kind of close in size so that they cook at about the same uh, pace. Now, remember I showed you how to hold your knife? Well, I also wanna show you how to hold the food they're working with with your other claw hand. So when you're working with the food and you're holding it in place, you don't wanna hold it like this because you're gonna, you might hurt yourself. The action, the, and you guys are gonna have to practice this at home. Okay, but the, the way that you're gonna move your knife with food is you're going to hold it at the base and you're gonna keep the tip always in touch with the cutting board and rock and roll. So you're rocking and pushing forward and back, forward and back, forward and back like that. You're not going like this, okay? You're going like this, push, push, push. And I cut all of these things fairly, uh, you know, close in size. I could make them even thinner, but I'm not going to. And I'm gonna hold my product like a claw and I'm going to cut, as I told you. See how my knife is rocking back and forth? I'm moving it up. Now this, I don't be annoyed if this takes a lot of practice to do, but it does and it's worth it because it makes things a lot easier, ultimately. Another thing I wanna tell you is that I just did something you shouldn't do. Um, and that is use your knife as a scraper like that, because that's how you dull it. Whenever possible, use this. If you can get one of these, they're really handy. Um, it's a scraper and you can use it to move things around on your board and it just makes things a lot more simple. And I'm just gonna rock and roll a little bit more. And in the meantime, uh, while you are chopping, and I think you are, I'm going to heat up. Now, I know this is fattening, Marcel, <laughs> but you What's don't need that? to use, oh. I'm making this a little bit fattening, but you don't need to use a lot of butter. You can use half of this amount. Um, and more broth, but I'm gonna just use a whole stick of butter for this, the case here. Um, I'm gonna heat up, I'm gonna heat up my pan and melt some butter. You can use a little butter with a little uh, vegetable oil. I don't recommend using any uh, olive oil in this because it, it, wouldn't, it won't taste good. Um, so now that we have cut up our, our main celery and that kind of thing, I might as well throw in a garlic clove too, I think, right? So it's funny because in culinary school and in professional kitchens I've worked in, every time I'd be with a chef, they would always kind of, they go, 
they go, and that's how they would get the skin off of their garlic. I don't know if you saw that, but I just push, put my weight on it. But uh, I would always do this, which is a lot less safe. I would always put the angled part up of the garlic and then hit it. <laughs> and I don't, I try not to do that as much, but it's kind of a habit. Um, and then you're just gonna maybe take the little ends off if you feel the need to do that. I don't always do that. And you're gonna kind of do the same thing that you just did with, with your other vegetables and just kind of go through it like that. You don't have to really chop it too finely. Have a little garlic there. Always keep your garlic, always keep your garlic separate from your other vegetables when you're doing a saute. And the reason for that is that garlic has sugars in it that burn and you will ruin your dish if you put the garlic in with the onions and the celery at the same time. So I'm waiting for my butter. I think it's fine now. I wanted to also mention that when I'm cooking, when you're cooking with butter, uh, it's a good idea sometimes to cut the butter with vegetable oil because vegetable oil prevents the burning. Butter has a very, very low smoke point. So it's going to start smoking quickly. Now it's, bur it's getting burny already, see? I'm not gonna put my garlic in. I don't know if you see this, see how it's a side. I turn this down a little bit and I'm just gonna throw in my veggies. Take a wooden spoon and just saute them. There's a lot of butter in there. You don't have to put that much butter in it, but now you can turn the heat up and just let that sweat out a little bit, okay? So I'll let you do that for a while. I wanted to get that started. Um, I also wanna chop up a couple of um, herbs for you while you're sauteing. So I just put a little bit of parsley, um, maybe a little bit of uh, thyme. Thyme, you're gonna wanna take it like this. I'm gonna keep stirring. Keep the heat medium on that so it doesn't burn. And I'll put my garlic in in a minute, but I'm taking the, see how I'm taking the time off? I'm just uh, taking the, each branch and just kind of pulling it backwards. And that's how I'm getting my time. That's how I get time in my day. Okay. And if you can't follow along with this, you can certainly remember this and do it, you know, after we're talking. Um, and a little bit of sage. I'm gonna stir again. I don't want, I don't want this to burn at all. Um, once I've chopped this up, then I can throw my garlic in and it won't burn. Does anybody want to do the gluten-free croutons? Yes, I'm doing them. Okay, you know, Marcel, you just, you don't need to toast them or do anything. All you need to do is, I'll show you. Okay. But, um, we can't, you can toast them if you want to, but it, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because okay. it's all going to just be, you know, mushy okay. and wet again anyway. All right. So I chopped up those herbs. I'm going to put this garlic in now because this is sweating out a little bit. My garlic is going in so it won't burn. You get that, right? If I, if I had put the garlic in initially, this would be burnt by now. The garlic would be burnt. So I'm just stirring that up and it smells really good. I have chicken broth on my tray. Um, I also have a sheet pan here that I buttered. You see, I just took a little cube of butter and I buttered it. And if you have a sheet tray, go ahead and find one and do the same thing. Um, if you don't have a sheet tray, you can use a baking dish as well. I just think the sheet tray will work better to get this crispier. What we're gonna do is we're gonna press the stuffing into the sheet tray. 
So I'm going to move that over here. Oh, stirring. And my helper telling me to stir. Okay, so that's pretty much looking good. I'm going to give that another minute. And what we'll do is now we're just going to add a bag of herb stuffing to that as soon as I feel it's cooked. And the way you'll be able to tell is because the onions will start to turn a bit translucent. Um, and the garlic will, will be a little bit golden. You don't want it to be brown. So we'll just stir that up. So this is just making your basic, basic uh, stuffing. Now, I wanna to talk to you about what you can do to this basic stuffing to make it not so basic. Kayla, can you come help? Okay, so I, I just threw my herbs in and now I'm gonna turn this down and I'm just gonna stir in a whole bag of herb seasoned classic stuffing. You could make your own croutons and I'll show you how you do that. Yeah. Okay, so I am stirring that up as you see, kind of toasting the bread. And Alexander, can you look, I want to, I think it's a, a one cup on the, on this package of broth. You're going to take some chicken broth, put it into your cup. I think it's a cup worth. And you're just going to drizzle it on top of your stuffing for a box it will be maybe, maybe two cups. Yeah, two cups. So I'm gonna just take a cup. I'm gonna take two cups worth. Just tipping over. And just pour that in. And this is really a basic stuffing, okay? Let that absorb, stir it. Now, if you wanted to make this a unique stuffing and something different, what you could do is, for example, fry up some breakfast sausage, get about a quarter cup of maple syrup, toast up some walnuts and add that to this and then you'd have a kind of a breakfasty flavor one. If you wanted to take this basic stuffing and you know make it an Italian version you could have added a little bit of chopped fennel to our saute and then put some Italian sausage with fennel in it which was already cooked and maybe a little brown butter and some fried sage for example. Um, you could also do uh, like a citrus flavored uh, something with uh, like, um, uh, what could I think of? Taking uh, one of the, I have an orange here somewhere. If you take a, a, a tool like this, which is a microplane, and you take the skin off of of this, of an orange, you can get orange zest and add that to stuffing. And then you can put, I'm trying to think of what I would put in that. I actually thought of it. Um, something like um, cranberries with that and bacon, something like that. So you can, you can really be creative with stuffing. Um, if you don't have a microplane, it's a cool tool. It's not an expensive thing. It'd be a great thing to get for Christmas in your stocking, as long as it's well wrapped. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, what do okay. I do with the gluten-free bread? Okay, I'm going to show you that right now. Yes. So does everybody see that the stuffing is done now? All right. Yeah, and Marcel, I am going to, do you have a bag of bread? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to let this cool a minute. Alexander, can you come take this away and wash it and then bring it back to me? This. Um, so what you're gonna do with that, Marcel, is you're just gonna get a cutting board 
and take your gluten-free bread. Um, I'll just demo a couple pieces for you, mm -hmm. but get a bowl. You would get a kind of large mixing bowl if you could. Um, and I used to do this all the time at Harker because I was in charge of the gluten-free sections at Harker. And so I would make gluten-free croutons every, every day or once every couple of days. And, you know, croutons, just like stuffing, you can do anything to, right? So you just, you just take your gluten-free bread, you're gonna cut it like that. Mm -hmm. Into cubes. See how my cutting board is moving around? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna fix that. So annoying. <laughs> I'm gonna be my own teacher. Okay. But see, see what I did, Marcel? Another one. Um, so in order to uh, do your stuffing, all you would need to do is uh, cube it up mm -hmm. and then add it to what I would do if I were you is I would, I would do the whole thing, maybe two, two bags, throw them on a sheet tray, Yeah. throw them in the oven and just let them get hard. You know, okay. They don't. You don't need to put any oil on them or anything. You just want them to kind of dry out, okay. so that they'll have a little bit of texture when you make your stuffing. Mm -hmm. The stuffing that I used isn't my favorite stuffing. I like the cube stuffing best because it has like a texture to it. Um, so this and gluten free is really good. I mean, it makes great stuffing because it's a little bit crispy. I don't know. Right. It's very good for the, for for stuffing. Um, so you get that idea. So you would just put this on a sheet tray, yes. throw it in 350 for 15 minutes, keep an eye on it so it doesn't burn. And mm -hmm. then you would just go ahead and do the same exact thing we just did. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. I'm going to move that out of the way. Okay. So now we, we're just going to take our stuffing and put it, press it into a greased pan. Like I just prepared it earlier. And I have something that I think everybody should have in their kitchen because I feel like the most useful tool in a kitchen is actually your hands. Um, and I, we were always required in professional kitchens to use gloves and I got really used to it. I don't love these gloves that I got here. It's really hard to find gloves nowadays. Um, but these are latex they're a little too big for me, but it's nice to use them when you're dealing with stuffing or you're dealing with, you know, raw meat, that kind of thing. So I'm just gonna take my stuffing. Now you could do this also in like a muffin tins if you wanted, um, but I thought this would be easier. So I'm just gonna spread that out on the buttered pan like so. This is just in case you didn't feel like putting it inside your, ch your chicken, okay? And then I'm, what I did earlier, which you can make a note of, you don't have to do this, it's just easier. Um, thank you. In terms of uh, getting things done and sh showing them to you visually. I cubed some butter like this and I chilled it. So you just dot, this with butter so that it'll brown nicely and be really yummy. And this will cook for about 35 to 45 minutes. I'll have to check it at about 20 to see where, where it is. And we'll throw that in the oven too, okay? Another thing to think about, it's really important is, now I'm looking at my chicken and it's getting golden. I'm happy. Um, is You have to think about what's going in your oven, especially when you're making things like a meal like Thanksgiving, or you you have multiple dishes going on at once, because you may not have space in your oven for the things you think you have space for, um, and so you have to really be careful. Uh, you know, if you have a, a huge sheet pan and then you want to put another dish in, it takes up too much room. You're kind of in trouble there. 
Um, so we're done with our stuffing. I'm gonna move that out of the way, Alexandra, <laughs> my helper. Um, and now we're gonna move on to our Brussels sprouts. Um, I don't, I'm not trying to rush you guys, but I don't want you to have to be here for the rest of your lives. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so this is a really easy dish. Um, here on my tray is what I have, is this is coconut oil. Um, you don't need to use coconut oil. You could use just vegetable oil or olive oil. I wouldn't use olive oil, I use vegetable oil. Um, olive oil won't taste right with this. Uh, coconut oil has a little bit of a sweetness to it and the flavor that's nice. And so I really like to use, especially with Brussels sprouts because it kind of almost makes them like a candy. They're really delicious. So I'm just gonna microwave this for a few seconds. And um, I have a bowl. I have some cranberries. I'm gonna add a little bit of water, warm water to them to kind of reconstitute them. And uh, I'm, if you have Brussels sprouts, you probably have about a pound of Brussels sprouts. You probably don't need that whole, uh, that whole amount, but get a cutting board and I'm running out of cutting board. What's going on with my microwave? Um, and take your Brussels sprouts. You'll see that um, they have little stalks at the end like this that are sometimes brown and hardened. I don't know why, but I love those little stalks. <laughs> Um, and they are, these are not brown and hardened. So I didn't want to cut them off. I like the texture um, that they have. So I didn't cut them off. But if you want to cut them off, because they can be a little tough, just cut the little ends off. And sometimes you'll lose a few leaves, but that's okay. See? And these are really nice looking Brussels sprouts. So they don't have any discoloration or dirt, dirty leaves or anything. I washed them and let them dry, but just slice them in half like that. And this one has a pretty big stock, so I'll take that off. And so while you are doing that, um, I will just show you that I have already done that. <laughs> Cause I feel like I'm like Rachel Ray or something. So then you just put, I just put some on, on, I'm not putting a lot because I only have a small sheet pan because I don't have a lot of room in my oven, but I put, you know, maybe a quarter pound in a bowl. I'll add these two. And then I have butternut squash. Butternut squash, I always make myself cut butternut squash myself because I feel like I, I have to because I'm a chef. <laughs> but today I didn't. I always want to use the vegetable from its or origin because it, I feel like its integrity hasn't been compromised in any way but it's really hard to cut a butternut squash and it's dangerous. Um, the way that I do it, honestly, is I take the butternut squash, I take my knife and then I take like a rubber hammer and hit the knife so that it opens up my butternut squash. But it's, it's not an easy thing to do and peeling it is a nightmare. So just get these. <laughs> and if they're the right size, um, which they are here, I'm just gonna add enough to equal my Brussels sprouts. And then I'm going to put my cranberries in there. Um, and then I'm going to pour some coconut oil. I'm gonna melt this a little bit more. Not like my microwave is acting up making me nervous. I feel like my microwave is about to die any minute now. It really is. Uh, yep, see, something's going on there. Anyway, I think it's the coconut oil that's doing it. So anyway, I'm pouring the coconut oil on it. This is another moment for the gloves, just because then you can throw them away if your hands are really oily. And I hope I'm not going too quickly for you guys. Um, Coconut oil, would you say you used? Um, this is just a 
Trader Joe's organic triple filtered coconut oil. How much? That's, oh, oh, uh, probably about four tablespoons. Um, not much more than that. It's okay if you put a little bit more in. Um, it's not going to really hurt. It's just going to just caramelize it all the more. And you're just going to toss that around. I kind of feel like I need a little bit more, but I'm afraid of my microwave, so I'm not going to do it. And then we're going to salt this. And I'm going to add a little bit of vegetable oil to this because because of, I'm afraid of my microwave. But I also peppered that. I'm gonna add a little vegetable oil. I'm not adding olive oil just because, and the reason I'm adding vegetable oil is just because I'm worried about my coconut oil and I don't, I wanna coat it. I'm worried about my microwave. So there you go. I just got them nicely saturated with oil, salt and pepper. Feel like that's good enough. And then I'm just gonna pour that onto a sheet tray and kind of spread them out evenly. We can do that. Okay, and that goes in the oven too. Now, I made room for it. Remember, we have to think of that. That's why I have a small sheet tray. No, fit it in there, but only so. You know what I'll do is I'll move my chicken a little bit. That's what I was planning on doing initially. So, the chicken is looking good. I would like to baste the chicken a little bit with some broth. So I'm going to take my baster and some broth, which was open. Is this the one that's open? No. Thank you. And uh, what's gonna happen is when I, when I baste the chicken, it's gonna mix with the juices. I'm gonna use some of this broth and it's gonna mix with the juices at the bottom of the pan. And, uh, And I'm gonna pull it out a little bit. You can see, you probably can't see, obviously, but it is golden looking and pretty. I'm taking my baster, and if you can see, filling it up, and I'm just gonna try to not get it all over my oven. And I don't want it to be dry, so I really want to do this a couple more times during this cooking process. I almost, and what I do with turkey, and I almost wanted to do it with this, and I think I might do it now, is tent this chicken with foil so that it doesn't burn too much on the top um, because it's nice and brown right now. Um, a lot of people will say, won't even mention to do that, but I think that um, it all depends on your oven and you're looking at it. Um, I feel like it's getting so golden now that if I leave it uncovered, it's going to be dried out by the end of the cooking time. Alexandra, did you set the timer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it is, it's in there for an hour and a half. What we want to do is tent it like that, just so that the direct heat doesn't burn the top of it too much. I'm going to add a little more breath just to the bottom of the pan, like that, just so we have some sauce to deal with later. Okay. You. you can take that. The broth can be filled up, Alexander, and we're going to use more later. Okay. So now that we have those items in the oven, we're going to move on to our salad. Um, I have a stray Brussels sprout, and I don't want to put it into this bowl because the cruciferous vegetables ruin the broth. <laughs> Here comes Alexander with this big bowl, big thing. Okay, you can put that right there, carefully, carefully. 
and take this away. Okay. Okay. So now this is, uh, we're making a salad. The first thing I want to do in making this salad is wash my knife because I want my knife to be clean and wash my hands because I don't want my hands to be greasy because I don't want to have an accident and cut myself. Um, what, what the idea behind this salad is for me is let's say you want to have, you know, chicken can be down home, but it can also be a little bit uh, glamorous if you want it to be. And if you're having people over, even though we can't have a lot of people over, say you're having a couple over, it's nice to have your first course, a course that doesn't need to be heated and can be ready in your refrigerator, uh, ready to go, you know? So I have first on my tray, uh, I have some salad dishes. I recommend putting them in the refrigerator. Um, I could have done that before, but I just didn't. Another thing that you might wanna do just because it makes things a little bit more festive is when you're gonna be serving a nice meal, put your oven to 170 warm and throw your plates in so that they get nice and warm. Um, that's a nice way of keeping things like a restaurant since we can't go to restaurants anymore. Um, so the first thing you wanna do is I have toasted some walnuts and I've chopped them. If you have a little pan like this, throw some walnuts in. I did extra because I wanna use them for some other purpose, but you only need about a quarter cup and we don't have to really measure things out in any of this. A lot of this is just kind of, as they say in French, they say au pif, by the tip of your nose. It's like you're feeling it out. Um, so I'm not gonna measure things with a measuring cup or anything like that. I'm just gonna kind of give you an idea. Um, so this is about a quarter cup of toasted walnuts. It's really good to toast your nuts because it really brings out that nutty, tasty earthiness. I could have used, and Marcel will be proud of me, candied walnuts, but I didn't because it's healthier and less fattening not to use <laughs> candied walnuts. So, and I also prefer, whoops, them like this. The arthritis in the sun. Okay, so this is an endive. Show, show you what I have on my tray first. Um, I have a red onion, uh, a bowl of lemon water, I have a red and a green apple. I know I didn't tell you guys to get a red and a green apple. So one, a green apple is fine, but if you have a red apple, that's kind of fun. And I'm just demoing this for you so you can do it in the future too. Um, I also have some crumbled Stilton cheese. This is Stilton cheese. Alexandra and I love Stilton cheese now. It used to be Roquefort cheese, that was my thing. Um, I have Roquefort cheese too. And you can get Roquefort cheese at Trader Joe's. Um, this is the brand that I would buy when I lived in France, um, Societe. But I will tell you that I know the difference and why Trader Joe's has Societe. Um, because Societe is a really good uh, cheese. But you know how cheese can get a little bit too ripe? Blue cheese can get really, really ripe. And that's why they get a good deal on this. I figured it out. They have the ripe Societe. Uh, but it's still good. I'm using for the sake of the salad, we're using Stilton cheese. And it's not that hard to crumble. What you're gonna do is kind of slice it, you know, keep it chilled and then slice it and then kind of crumble it up with your fingers. It's much better than gorgonzola or any of that crumbled cheese that you find in the grocery store. Definitely get your hands on some good blue cheese for this. And you can find that at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's for a really good price. Um, I didn't find any purple endives, and I know you guys had some trouble with that too, um, but this is a similar type of a, of a chicory vegetable. It's called uh, radicchio, and radicchio is uh, bitter. Sometimes it's, I like cooking it, roasting it, cutting it into quarters, and then drizzling it with, uh, with, uh, with uh, balsamic vinegar and olive oil, and it's really good like that, but today, we're just gonna use it for color in our salad. 
So we've got the radicchio and we've got some endives. And so I just wanted to show you all the things that we do have. On your tray or around you, you might have a coffee cup or any kind of cup. Um, what I want you to do is make a vinaigrette and we're gonna make the most simple vinaigrette. Uh, this vinaigrette has Dijon mustard in it, Dijon, uh, apple cider vinegar or champagne vinegar is fine. Um, I just wouldn't wanna use red just because the red wine vinegar might make the leaves look gray. Um, so you wanna keep it like a light colored vinegar. Um, and so how you make a vinaigrette is you take a fork. This is, I do this probably once every two days at my house. Um, and, and I don't do anything fancy. I don't add shallots or garlic or anything. Um, you take your Dijon mustard and you're gonna take a fork, take a big dollop. Alexandra, again, she puts in like half a jar of mustard. I don't know what that's about, but she likes it that way. I put in two big forkfuls <laughs> and then I add salt, two big pinches, maybe three. I'm gonna add some pepper, big pinch, and I'm gonna add vinegar and the order isn't important except that you don't want to put the oil in first um, or at, until you put the vinegar. Just about a quarter cup of apple cider vinegar. And always use a fork. Do not use a spoon for this. And if you have, we have like a salad mixing tool, like a salad dressing mixing cup, and that works great. But for the sake of, of just making this vinaigrette, just do that. And so I'm mixing it with my fork. That way it's not splattering out into my face. And if you add the oil before this, the it won't dissolve the salt. So make sure that you don't add the oil until after you've mixed the vinegar, the salt, the pepper, and the mustard together and emulsified that or gotten it mixed together. And then we'll add some olive oil to that. I would prefer that you use walnut oil. Um, and you could use some walnut oil and some vegetable oil because walnut oil is really expensive and you just want the flavor of it, but I don't have any walnut oil. So I'm gonna use olive oil. And you know, they always say when you make vinaigrette that you should put uh, one quarter of the vinegar mixture and two, two quarters or three of, of the olive oil. And it's, to me, I, I do, half and half almost, or no, I do, I'm so bad with, with numbers, but it's, I do three quarters olive oil to half, does that make sense? I don't put a lot, I don't put a lot of olive oil in it. I put, I like to have it really pungent, um, but if you like it pungent, not pungent, and you like a lot more oil in it, go ahead and do that. But the less oil you put in it, the less you have to use and that makes it a lighter dish, a lighter dressing. So I'm gonna taste it and it's really pungent, but good. Also, um, I don't do this a lot, but a lot of people love to add a little of a sweet element. So I will add a little bit of a sweet element. This is uh, just regular honey. And that can go in anytime. I mean, it probably would have been better if I put it in the beginning, but it'll melt in there. And just to add, to round out the flavor so it's not too tart. Now I've got salad dressing for a week. You never have to buy salad dressing. Alexandra is going to be happy because she doesn't have to make vinaigrette today because we're out. Okay. So. I'm going to come take this away. I'm taking it away. Um, so the next step is I've washed my apples and I just wanna show you, this is something that a chef would do for presentation. So I'm gonna take the prettiest part of my apple, my red apple, I'm gonna cut it off. And I'm gonna take the prettiest part of my green apple, cut it off like that. And then I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna put that in my lemon water so it doesn't get brown. I'm also going to take, uh, I don't know where it went, but I have a little bowl with water in it here. 
Um, I'm going to show you how to cut some onion in a little different way for this particular dish. So I'm gonna take my red onion and I'm gonna, cut, now I, I am gonna take both ends off, okay? So before when I was trying to show you how to dice it, I would not allow you to ever take off the root end. But when I do this particular cut, it's called a Lyonnaise cut. And you're gonna cut both ends off like this. And you're going to peel off the skin, which is not always easy. If you can't always get the skin off, you can, you can cut it off or you can take off the first layer because I can use it in soup. Okay. So see how I've cut it now? I've got the two sides off. Um, this is how you would, for example, cut for making like a fajita or something you would, you would cut like this. See how my cut is different now? Then it's not a dice anymore. But for this purpose, I just want some rings, thinly sliced rings for my salad. So I'm just going to do as thinly as I can. And because red onion can be really, really tough, um, a little bite to it, I sometimes will put it in a little bit of water just to take the bite off of it. Just let it soak for a little bit like that. Keep my onion for my later soup situation. And uh, I needed that bowl. I just used that bowl, <laughs> this bowl. Because my, here's my veggie bowl. That's okay. <laughs> um, so this bowl, in this bowl, now we're gonna take, uh, you see that this endive has like a little bit of browning going on. So we'll take off the parts that are brown. In France, I could buy a huge bag of endives, nothing, um, eat them every day. And they are a winter vegetable. Um, and I would cut them like this. I would go, ch -ch 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 -ch. but actually in restaurants and stuff, they don't like that. And they want to show the, the leaf more. So I would cut it more kind of like this. So you've got like, you can kind of see the leaf a little bit more. The core, a lot of people think is bitter, but it's my favorite part. Okay. Um, and endives aren't cheap in this country, <laughs> but they're worth it. If you don't have an endive, you can use, um, Bill, the, this lettuce that we were talking about is escarole. Escarole is a really great uh, lettuce to use. You can find that at, uh, to mix with like another lettuce, say romaine or something like that because it's got a really nice texture to it. Um, don't use, like I said, don't use spring mix because it won't hold up. So we cut that up. I cut that a little too small, but let's do this. Got a lot of salad here. <laughs> okay, so there's your lettuce. And now what I'm gonna do is I want to compose the salad on a plate um, so that it looks pretty um, rather than just whoops, tossing them all in everything in this bowl. I'm going to compose the salads on the plates, but I want to show you how to cut um, these apples. We're going to cube them. Now I already cut part of them off, but I'm going to peel my apple gonna be a little painful and take a while. But um, actually, I think I won't peel. I don't think I'm gonna leave my red on and my green on because even though it's a little tough, I like the color. I change my mind a lot when I cook. Um, so what we're gonna do is we wanna create what I wanna call planks um, out of the flesh of these apples. So I'm just gonna cut 
planks is until I can't anymore. See, I can't right there. Stopping me. Cut a plank. I want them to be about a quarter inch thick. Cutting plank. See how I did that? And even this apple can be used in a broth. Okay. And then I'm doing the same with this green apple. I'm going to put them in my lemon water because the minute that they touch the air, they get brown. And I'm going to do my plank again. It's a little too thin. So I have a lot of apple in this salad. And then you're just going to take, and this is, takes patience, but take a couple at a time and make them uniform cubes. Mid, I would call this a medium dice and as uniform as you can. You can just put those in on top of your salad. And see how we've got the green color now, which is nice. I'm glad I didn't peel them. I almost peeled them. Also add a little bit of texture. This is where I'm gonna be using this tool. Should be using it more often. And just, you know, this takes a little patience because I don't like to pile things up on top of each other when I'm cutting vegetables. I kind of like to take my time or, or you know, fruit. And Alexander, do you mind going and taking a look and maybe um, doing another uh, basting? Thank you. So we might, might want to baste our chicken again. Keep it nice and hydrated. That was a little thin. Okay, as you see, I'm trying to make these all fairly uniform. And um, I don't know if you were able to toast any walnuts, but if you do, you don't have to toast them. I just think that it tastes better when you do. You can do them in a little pan like this, but you have to really keep an eye on them because they will burn very, very quickly. Um, I have been known to burn entire huge sheet pans of, of uh, nuts in commercial kitchens. <laughs> um, pine nuts are the worst, but uh, you can also do that in an oven. I wouldn't recommend doing it in the microwave though. Alicia, why did you say that about pine nuts? Why are they the worst? Pine nuts have a really high uh, level of oil in them and they're really small. So they have an increased surface area. Mm -hmm. And so when you put them in the oven, they go from being golden brown to burnt in about 10, 15 seconds. Oh, okay. So the way I like to do pine nuts is I do them in a little pan like this. And oh. I do not leave, I do not leave sight of the okay. pine nuts. And it's painful because you have to stand there for a minute and then they start to turn golden and then you flip them around and then you pull them off or they'll be black. And yeah. pine nuts aren't cheap, as we yeah. all know, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry I'm taking so long on doing this, but I am doing uh, some, I'm not gonna do all of this red apple, but I wanna give you the idea for color, so. Not good, it allows us to catch up. <laughs> yeah, true, true, I want you to catch up. Um, so as you see, and you see I'm still using my same knife technique I'm using the claw hand and, uh, and you always want to take your time when cutting. You don't want to rush anything because, you know, it could be risky. This is going to be a good one with lots of uh, color. I'm flying everywhere. I'm not going to worry too much about these being cubes. We're just going to get them to be about the right size. I mean, if we were doing like high, high end cooking, there are knife cuts that are, you know, in culinary school, that you'd be measured for them. And one of the smallest is called a brunoise, brunoise. And it's like an eighth and an eighth of an inch quarter. Like it's ridiculous. And then, uh, then you have a, a medium, a small dice, a medium dice, and a large dice. And we had to practice on carrots for hours and hours and hours. 
Um, I think you get the idea though with the, uh, another thing I wanted to point out too is whenever you're using a knife, I always like to take my knife and place it above my cutting board faced away from me. I've been in too many situations where somebody has put their knife like this and they're working and then they cut themselves or they leave it like that and then it gets bumped and falls on their foot, that kind of thing. So it's just a good practice. Just always put it above your cutting board. Don't need that anymore. Another thing that's important is to get rid of things that you don't need all the time, which I'm not doing enough of, but okay. So that, and then I'm going to put that in my bowl and then I'm going to cut up a little bit of treviso or radicchio. Treviso is a similar thing, although it looks more like a big, long piece of romaine lettuce. Same, same flavor pretty much and the same, uh, same idea. But this is really just for color, you see? So these are done. This is all done. And I'm gonna toss that. And what I did was, because I made so much of this salad, I'm gonna put half of it away so that I can use it later, just for the sake of you guys getting this. Um, that can go in the fridge, Alexander. You're done. So I'm tossing this with my hands. My hands are clean. As you see now, it's looking a little bit more colorful, right? I'm gonna add just a few of these chopped nuts, not all of them. So in cooking, when you're doing pretty stuff and you want it to be presentable, you wanna always think about uh, garnish. So when you're using something, don't use all of it because you're gonna use it as garnish at the end, okay? Now, if this were just like a casual night here, I would probably dress this salad now, toss it and put it on the table. But for the sake of beauty, <laughs> um, what you guys will do is you will um, take your chilled plates out. Now, I don't want these plates, but they, I couldn't find my white plate. So you've got roosters going on here. <laughs> Go <through the> tip. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was really into roosters for a long time, okay? <laughs> but I like, I really believe that you should have white plates for all food. It's just the way I feel. Um, and I'm not showing you that right now. I'm sorry. Pretend that they're white. <laughs> um, so using your hands. I'm not using my gloves for this because my hands are clean and my hands aren't gonna be sticky or gooey or smell like garlic after this, you know? So I'm going to just take my salad. And also um, when you're doing a presentation, um, you, you know when you go to a restaurant that's a nicer restaurant, you don't usually have a huge amount of food on your plate. So I recommend kind of dialing back your portion sizes, you know, um, when you're having a dinner party. It's just more, I don't know, appealing that way. But what I was showing you earlier about putting the apple in the, in the lemon water is if you wanna get this done ahead of time, you can, you, can even, you can do all of this ahead of time, cube it up and just have it all in the lemon water and then strain out the lemon water, strain them out of the lemon water and put them in your salad. They will prevent the, uh, the apple from turning brown and the apple's gonna turn brown really fast. So don't plate this until you're really, really close to eat, ready to eat this. Um, like don't do this four hours in advance because your your apple will have turned um, brown unless you want to just put the apple on top at the last minute. Um, do you understand what I mean? I hope you do. Um, you could toss everything else together. Just put the apple in kind of on top at the end and it will still be fresh and not brown if it's been in lemon water. Then you're going to just put a little bit of nut on top each plate. So beautiful. And you're gonna also use a little bit of 
the blue cheese. Um, what I didn't do, and I probably should have done, is add the blue cheese to the mix a little bit so that it's almost like a blue cheese dressing that forms. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to. I wanted you to save at least some for garnish, as you see what I did here. So I saved a little bit of everything for garnish. Um, and the onion, you know, you can have added a head or just kind of put a few shaved onions on top that have been soaking because then they'll be a little less bitter. Um, there you go. Okay, so what you can do with that, if you're gonna you know, have that maybe an hour ahead of time, try and keep the apples out of it. Uh, and then just put the apples on top at the last minute, as, it, as I said. And then we'll just cover these with plastic wrap. And we'll have another look at the chicken. Alexander, can you have another look and see how she's doing? Um, also, we're gonna have a look at the stuffing. We wanna make sure that the stuffing is um, not burning. Okay, I think the stuffing is done. And we'll take that out and we'll cover it with some aluminum foil so it stays warm. I'm wrapping up our salads. So it is kind of nice. So you have people over, everybody has a glass of wine, you have your table set and you have your chicken, you know, it's ready. I don't have time to go over making a gravy with you most likely, but I want to talk to you about it because in fact, it's probably the easiest thing in the world. You can, once that chicken is cooked, you can just, let's pretend we didn't have the carrots in, uh, in there. You could just take a, a, like a potato masher, add a little bit of, take the chicken out of that pot, of that receptacle where the chicken is. Add just about a tablespoon of flour, take like a potato masher and mash up everything in the base of the chicken, where the chicken, under the chicken, and then push, push it through a strainer and then put it in a pot and let, and mix it up a little bit. And you don't even have to add broth to it because there's a lot of broth. And that'll be an amazing gravy because of your, your lemon, your garlic, you've got the onions in there. All you need to do is make your gravy in your, in your chicken pot holder thing. <laughs> um, and, and then you would strain it through like, just a regular strainer like this. So again, I'll go over what you would do. Alexander, can you put these? <laughs> Alexander's getting a workout. Can you put these in the fridge? So we'll put these in the fridge and they'll be ready for dressing. So you're not gonna dress these until just before serving. Um, you never wanna dress a salad before, you know, any time before, you know, you're right, right about to serve. Um, but talking again about the uh, broth, I'm talking about the uh, gravy. In the bottom of that pan, we have, I put carrots. I shouldn't have done that because that, that'll ruin that. But if you just had the onions you did and the garlic, right? When we take that chicken out, if we are still together, we'll take the chicken out and the skins will just come right off of the onion. The skin, we can pop the garlic right out of the skin. Okay, and we'll leave it all in the base of the pan. And you'll add a little bit of flour to that, kind of mix that up and then put it through one of these so that all that juice comes out into a little glass bowl or into a pot like this. So put it on the pot and then mix it up with a whisk and you've got an amazing gravy. You don't have to do anything complicated with that. Um, okay, so as you can see, our stuffing is out and it looks really crispy and crunchy, um, just exactly how we want it because we had the butter on it, so it's perfect. It might be a little bit brown on this end here, but it's really good. You can cut that up and um, if you're not ready to eat it, you cover it with a little bit of aluminum foil and then we can put it back in the oven just before you're ready to eat. Before you can, um, can we just look at it? I mean, oh, sure. Yeah, please. This is it. 
So this part is overdone here. So you'd probably want to keep an eye on that and maybe uh, I would say more like 30 minutes. Oh I think we had it in there for 45. Mm -hmm. um, but this is nice because you can even use, um, I don't think I have them with me. Oh, I see. But, it. Uh, let me, yeah, do you see it? Uh -huh. Great. So what would be fun is if you cool that, I have these, you see these? And I never can get them out, but um, they're little cutters little, uh, they're really fun. I, I think um, you can make like a little thing like that, you know, and then put that plate that on your, um, on your plate with your chicken if you wanted to, or you could just cut them into squares, that kind of thing. These are a little, they're a little bit, they fall apart a little bit too much. So I'm not sure I would use this for this particular thing, but these are really fun to have. They are a really good way of plating. And you can find these anywhere online. They're called ring ring cuts or something like that. Um, and there you have it. I think we've gone through pretty much everything. Um, we're gonna have a look at the chicken and we're gonna have a look at our, our red peppers. Can you clean this up a little bit and wipe it and I'll... So this looks to be about done. I would say that, uh, I don't know if you can see here, it's pretty color. Um, if anything, I wish that I could have used a bigger pan and I wanna to explain to you why. Um, the reason why I had to use this smaller sheet pan here um, because of my oven size and I needed to fit this inside. But when you crowd a pan, as I did here a little bit, you'll see that some of these have caramelized, but a lot of moisture has collected, almost like it's steaming. And that's because of the pan is too crowded. So that's a really important thing to remember. If you can do this on a larger pan um, with this, about the same amount, about a, a half pound of both ingredients, you'll have better caramelization. But this is pretty much done. I'm gonna leave it in just a little bit longer because it will probably get a little bit more caramelization. Um, but that's a really good tip to remember. You guys all probably have much bigger ovens than I have, <laughs> um, but I was kind of limited by my size of my oven. Um, and on timing, I wanted to tell you that the chicken should come out, if you have an instant read thermometer, um, which we do, um, it should be at about 165 uh, at its deepest interior. And that would probably be in the leg. Um, if it is at 155, 160, that's probably okay to pull it out then because it'll rest and it will continue to cook a little bit. Um, another way of telling whether a chicken is well cooked is just by shaking hands with it. And if, it, if the leg moves readily, it, it probably means that it's done. Also, you, if you cut between the leg and the breast and look to see if the juices are running clear, that's another way of telling. Um, we're gonna have a look at it now and just see if my insulin thermometer is working without my eyeballs. I need my eyeballs to do that. Because we have, Alexander set the timer for an hour and a half, but these things can vary, so. It's reading 142, 145, 146, 147, 148. So it probably needs a few more minutes. Um, about 13 more minutes. <laughs> yep, Alexander got it. So that's about right. Um, we will have. Uh, chicken, I take this off now, I'm not too worried about it burning, um, that will be perfectly cooked. 
in 13 minutes. I don't know about you guys. How far along are you on your cooking process with the chicken? I think my chicken has about 20 minutes to go. The stuffing's done. And maybe okay. the veggies, probably about five to seven minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, we can uh, conclude now if you want to, or um, I can, I, I think we should probably, oh, <laughs> do you have any questions? <laughs> Alexander's going in the background. <laughs> do you have any, any questions that I can answer? That's what we should go over because mm -hmm. I kind of barraged you with a lot of, of information quickly. Um, and we didn't get to a dessert or anything like that um, because it would have just taken too much time. Um, but, you know, I think that you'll find that this is a, this is a pretty delicious meal to have on a Sunday or for a party if you want to have it you know, for a sit down gathering. Um, I also, because we're probably not gonna be able to take the chicken out together um, before you ask any questions, I wanna tell you that the chicken, um, what you're gonna need to do, it, you do this with all meat, and any meat that you're gonna cook, is you're gonna let it rest for at least 15 to 20 minutes. So you're gonna take the chicken out and we're gonna put the chicken on a cutting board like this. And this kind of cutting board will catch the juices. So you, you put the chicken on the cutting board here, cover it with aluminum foil and go away for 20 minutes. And the reason for that is that all the juices will start to kind of go back into the bird. They'll also come, come out. Any of the juices that collect here will add to the gravy, if you have the gravy um, going. And then you can more easily take the chicken apart and carve the chicken. And so um, the way you would carve the chicken is, um, I'm doing this without the chicken, <laughs> but you would take the chicken once it's rested and you would take off, first you would take off each leg and maybe even break the chicken leg into two parts. And you'll be, you would be able to find where those joints are if you kind of feel around with your knife. And if you get the right spot, you'll be able to get right through the leg, chicken leg um, and thigh. And usually when you have a chicken leg and thigh, it's kind of at an angle. So you're gonna kind of cut through the chicken leg and thigh at an angle and then place those on your tray and then you would then have your breast of chicken. And the way you would get to that is you would cut right down the back middle of the chicken. And you can even use your fingers if it's not too hot to pull the whole breast off of the carcass. You can get so down and dirty in there with your hands that you can get it to the point where you're not missing any, any meat at all. And you'll take off a whole breast and it's covered in that golden skin and you put that on the tray and then you do it the same with the other breast. Um, or you could leave the breast on your cutting board, let it sit there for a minute and slice that. So, so you have the breast sitting this way oblong, you would take it and make big chunky slices out of it so that you could see the brown skin on each slice and then arrange the the breasts like that you'd have your chicken wet legs in two parts so you'd have those and you could even take the wings off and put those on as well and if you had had any vegetables in there you could kind of put them around or underneath that and it's just a really pretty way of of kind of having it in family style and people can serve themselves um, and it's not fancy, like you don't, you know, we did that with our turkey, you know, we didn't have to sit there with a special carving knife and make these thin slices, you know, just make it rustic. It's, it tastes better that way. It's more fun. Um, but I think that's all I have for you because we still have another 
you know, I don't know, you guys have like 20 minutes at least and then 20 minutes to let your birds rest. Um, any questions that you might have for me that I have missed? This is wait, really, Bill, Bill's going to tell me. <laughs> really informative. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I wish I could meet you guys in person <laughs> again. Later, later. Maybe soon. Yeah, maybe I'll come to church and check it out because I haven't gotten to be there in a long time. Yeah. So, and if anybody ever needs any help with teaching classes or you know, any food prep or help in that way. I do that as a business on the side. So I actually cook for Marcel's family once in a while. And I have cooked for um, a lot of people in, the, in this area. Um, I also do small caterings for 20 people and under usually I can do more, but I try to keep it less. I like to do small dinner parties that are can be fancy. Um, and I'd like to teach. So if anybody ever wants to have another class in some other area of cooking, let me know. I'd be happy to do that for you. Yes. Um, so in case you need it, I just put up Alicia's information on the screen. So um, take a picture of it or write it down, but it's all up here. Her cell phone. And if you're on Instagram, her Instagram handle is also up on the screen. Okay. Thank you. I feel like such an influencer now. <laughs> I have a handle on Instagram. <laughs> you thank do. you so much, everybody. <laughs> okay, thank you, Alicia. It was hey, Marcel. If anybody, then... you're welcome. If you, if anybody yeah. has a question, they can call. They can call me, or they can text you, and you can call me if something yes. goes wrong. I'll sure. be here all night. Okay. All right. That's okay. Great. Take a picture okay. of mine once it's done as well. Okay, I will. Yeah. My Instagram right now is not devoted to food, but I'm trying to start a new Instagram okay. for food. Um, yes. So when I do that, um, I'll let you guys know. Uh, okay. Alicia, how do you pronounce your last name? It's actually, it's, it's my last name is Park, P-A-R-K-E, and then Galou, G-A-L-O-U. Okay. So Thanks. I usually, I, I, I kind of go by everything. So, <laughs> so that's, I think I'm under Park Galu on Instagram. Lovely. This is just great. Thank you. Have All a right. lovely evening, everyone. And bon appetit. All right. Thanks so much. And thank you everyone for coming. Just a reminder, our next event will be on January 10th. And um, we're gonna have Shelly Ann Wong, who is a life coach, um, helping us set and keep New Year's resolutions. So I hope to see everyone then. Thank you again, Alicia. Thank you, Alexandra. Thanks. Thanks, Marcel. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everyone.